Greetings, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is Bible study time again, a time for us to delve into God's word and to study as we've been doing on a weekly basis. Uh, but before I do, uh, I just want to share three very important W's uh, that are important in our particular season in which we're in right now. Uh, the first is, first W is wear a mask. Wear a mask. Uh, the second W is to watch your distance. And the third is simply this, wash your hands. So I want us just to simply remember those three W's. I want to continue to reinforce this so that we can get our society, our economy, and all of our normal activities back to good use. But until we actually abide by those three W's, it is not going to happen. All right? Well, it's time to study God's Word. And so today, uh, I'm going to do a reboot similar to what I did on last week. And when I say a reboot, so what of a rewind uh, of my previous Sunday sermon. On this past Sunday, I preached from Proverbs 16 and verse 9. Uh, I'm going to teach from that same text on the night. The sermon Sunday was entitled, Holding On With a Loose Grip. Our Bible study is entitled, uh, Assurance of God's Direction. Assurance of God's Direction. So I just want to read Proverbs 16 and 9 once again. Uh, it says, The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Now, as we talk about the assurance of God's direction, I know that all of us struggle and grapple uh, with God's will, God's plan, God's purpose for our life. Uh, one of the things that believers do over and over again, we're constantly trying to figure out what God is doing. What is God doing in our world? But specifically, what is God doing in my life? And what does God want me to do? And so as we look at Proverbs 16 and 9, it says, and I made some observations on Sunday. Uh, it says that we make plans, but God is the one who directs our steps. And if I can just simply remind you of these observations, uh, understand that it's perfectly fine for us to plan. God wants us to plan. He wants us to make projections. Uh, he wants us to be looking to the future. But also understand that God's plans are always better than our plans. Then you need to understand that God may choose to change our plans. I know that's difficult, but God may choose to change our plans. And when God changes our plans, we can either resist God's change in direction or we can embrace what God is doing. So as we talk about the assurance of God's direction, the first thing I want to talk about is the problems that you and I face. Uh, more often than not, you and I are looking for assurance uh, specifically related to God's direction when we are facing problems in life. And unfortunately, uh, problems in life go hand in hand. And so whenever they come together, we need to be assured of God's direction. We don't want to be mistaken. We don't want to go left when God wants us to go right. Problems we face, the Bible deals with over and over again. Proverbs 14 and 12 says, There is a way that seems right to us, but the end thereof is destruction. Jeremiah, the prophet, says or states our inability to direct our own life apart from the direction of God. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, he says, Lord, we know that people do not control their own destiny. It is not their power to determine what happens to them. And then also uh, Isaiah, the prophet, tells us in Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9, Indeed, my plans, he says, are not like your plans, God says. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. Just as the sky is higher than the earth, so are my plans and my works superior to your plans and to your works. And so as we face problems in life, understand that as we face them, we're supposed to plan, we're supposed to work on them, but ultimately we are supposed to seek God's direction with the problems that you and I face in life. And so beyond the problems that we face, understand there's a promise that God gives. Listen, wherever there's a problem, there's always a promise from God. And what's important is we seek assurance of God's direction is that when we face a problem, we've got to find a promise from God that can override the problem we're facing. So the promise God gives is this, the declaration of scripture, the word of God, uh, which you and I are studying on a weekly basis, is that God cares about each of us. And because God cares about each of us, it also means that God cares about our problems. So much so 
that God providentially with his omniscience and his knowledge that is superior to eyes, ours, God has already made provision. God has already given a promise for every problem, every dilemma that you and I will face in life. His plans are superior to our plans in every detail, in every intricate aspect of his promise. His promises and his plans are greater than ours. Why is that? Listen, whenever we are looking for someone to give us expert advice, uh, someone to help us to deal with our dilemmas, whether they be government leaders, pastors, uh, counselors, healthcare professionals, uh, legal professionals, our assumption is that those individuals have more knowledge and more data as it relates to the situation than we do. Well, guess what? God has more knowledge than we do, and he obviously has more data than we do because his data is both past, present, and future. Uh, so much so that we need to understand that God has all power and all sovereignty to deal with our issues and our problems. Listen, God has all of the information. He has more data uh, about what's going on in our life than anyone else ever has or ever will. Uh, our responsibility as it relates to God's direction is for us to entrust our way and our plans to God's direction and God's leading. I love the book of Proverbs. Uh, it's a book of wisdom. Uh, wisdom, we know, first of all, is uh, a fear of the Lord, and it's the beginning of knowledge. Uh, as it relates to God's direction, Proverbs over and over again is reminding us uh, of our plans and God's plans being much greater. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is a life verse for so many, which says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him. And what does it say? He will direct your path. But then as I've read Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9, you can just back up in Proverbs chapter 16. Uh, you'll notice in verse 1, it says, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And then move down to verse 3. It said, Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. Now, what that means in verse 3 is we make our plans. But once we make our plans, we need to commit them to God before we act on our plans so that they can be established. What we do more often than not is that we make our plans, we make our plans, and we work our plans before we submit them to God. And then when they don't work out, then we want to come back to God and say, God, you got to fix this. God, you have to work it out. But before we start working on our plan and before we start implementing our plan, we need to commit those plans to God in prayer uh, before we proceed. All right. So we talked about the problems we face, talk about the promises that God gives. But then also we need to deal with the principles that we must apply in order to know God's direction. And those principles are twofold. They are devotion and desire. Devotion and desire are two principles that we need to keep in mind and must apply as we are seeking to be assured of God's direction. The essential foundation for both discovering and doing God's will or the will of God are devotion to God and the desire to do his will. Uh, Psalm 25 and verse 12 says, The Lord shows his faithful followers the way they should live. Uh, it's very interesting uh, as I kind of move uh, to the New Testament uh, and make application with the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul was a man who often spoke of his plans. Uh, he had plans to visit certain churches, and he would often uh, write to God or he wrote that God wanted him to achieve these specific plans. But scripture shows that although Paul had made a number of plans about visiting many churches and he had some good travel plans, his itinerary was set, his plans were not always accomplished. The fact that his plans were not always accomplished had nothing to do with the fact that they weren't good plans, really had nothing to do with the fact that they were not the original plans that God had given Paul. But the Lord was the one who was directing his path. For instance, in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10, uh, Paul had a desire uh, to go to a certain place. But in that dream, he received what was called the Macedonian call, 
where the Spirit of God spoke to him and hindered Paul from going the direction that he originally planned and sent Paul in another direction. Paul at that moment had the opportunity to either resist or to embrace. Paul chose to embrace God's plans and go in a different direction. He, he had to forego his pre-developed plans and go instead to Macedonia. Now, his plans were worthy. Uh, they were worthwhile. They weren't bad plans, but God changed his plans and he embraced them. On another occasion, this same Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27, which I also preached from a couple, two or three weeks ago, and then connected to Romans chapter 1, Paul had a sincere desire to go to Rome and preach. And as Paul was headed to Rome to preach, well, actually, Paul wound up going to Rome as a prisoner. Uh, he was a prisoner uh, in trouble for preaching the gospel over and over again, defying the government edict not to preach, not to proclaim the name of Christ. And he wound up going to Rome and God fulfilling his desire to go to Rome as a prisoner. On his way, we know in Acts 27, the ship uh, met some devastating storms one after another to the point that they wind up uh, being shipwrecked. But we notice at the end of that that Paul and the other persons or passengers who were on the ship when the ship broke up, they were able to either swim to shore or some made it on broken pieces. But ultimately, as we get to Romans chapter 1, we need to understand that Paul made it to Rome uh, in order to preach the gospel. So two different things. Sometimes we have a good plan, God changes the plan. Other times we have a good plan, but even though our good plan is met with obstacles, God still intends for us to keep going in the direction that God has set for us. As we deal with Proverbs 16 and 9, and then even as I've illustrated from the life of Paul, sometimes the word of God can be very difficult to swallow. The Bible is clear that God is supremely sovereign and in control of all things. He knows everything before it happens. He, he, he knows or declares the end from the beginning. It says in Isaiah 46 and verse 10. Nothing surprises God. Things may surprise us, but it's very difficult for us to understand and accept the reality and live under the challenge of walking by faith, even though we know that God is in control. It makes us uncomfortable really because we know that we have a free will and we try to balance that with God being sovereign. Ultimately, as we deal with Proverbs 16 and 9, it says we make plans that deals with our will, but then it also says that God directs our steps, which deals with his sovereignty. And it's often difficult to balance the idea of God being sovereign and our having free will. It's not saying that we are fatalist that we are determinist. In other words, every situation is determined, so we let go and let God. It doesn't mean that. Um, it also doesn't mean that we are robots, that God simply makes us move in the way that he wants. So we have to find, when it comes to the assurance of God's will, how is it that God's sovereignty and our free will as human beings works together? So we need to understand that God will often infringe on our choices. We do have free will, but then again, we really don't. In other words, we have free will, but our free will is not absolute and it's not perfect. Here's why. There are two biblical reasons why our free will is not absolute. First is, it is, it is constrained by our, our nature. I, I know that we're all about self-improvement and being the best version of ourselves that we can, but unfortunately, when sin entered the world in Genesis chapter 3, we became sinful human beings, and by nature, we have free will, we have the mental faculty and the mental capacity to make choices, but without God's leading, those choices more often than not are going to be outside of the will of God. So our free will and our decision making are constrained by our nature, but then we also need to understand that God can and does override our ability to choose and our ability to make choices when he sees something better for us. Again, Proverbs 16 and 1, we make, we make plans, but God's will determines if they will succeed or not. It's not our ingenuity. Proverbs 16 and 3, this really should cause us to be dependent upon God. And that's really what God wants. Out of his love and out of his care, he wants us to be dependent on him. Uh, it does not diminish our planning, but it does elevate God's role in the outcome. We plant, we water, 
but God gives the increase. And so we need to live in peace, recognizing that God is in control. Realizing that God is in control is not meant to scare us or to make us uncomfortable, but it's meant to help us to sleep at night. It is meant to really be a soft pillow at night. When we understand that God is sovereign, uh, it, it is that soft pillow at night that lets us rest and know that God is in control. There is a difference between what we actually plan and what actually happens, and we see that over and over again in life. And so whenever your plans change, whenever God overrides your plans or God sends you in a different direction, remember this promise from Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. It says that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and beyond and above all that we can ask or that we can think. So whenever we plan, understand that God can elevate our plans, God can elevate our projections to a place and to a point where they are better than the best laid plans that we can do without God. So certainly I want you to be assured of God's wonderful grace and allow that to be your soft pillow at night. As we conclude our study on today, I encourage you once again to continue to support our ministry, continue to support uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, you are being very dutiful and committed. We, we post reminders on our Bible study and on our Sunday morning services. You can give through our website. Uh, electronically, or you can send it to our post office box. But most of all, I want to thank you for being a very faithful viewer. You are viewing our Sunday morning services virtually. Uh, you are viewing our Wednesday studies virtually. Uh, and we want you to invite your friends to tune in with us. Um, it's not about us, it's about God. So if this word is blessing you, if our Sunday morning worship is blessing you, share that with others. Invite others to tune in and watch uh, along with you virtually. Uh, and we'll just pray uh, that God would bless us uh, as we worship him in this new and vital way. Uh, allow me to pray, uh, and then I look forward to seeing you on Sunday uh, and also seeing you on next week. God in heaven. Uh, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, we thank you for the assurance that comes from knowing your word and from knowing your will. God, we know as we seek assurance of your direction, we know, God, you'll help us to deal with the problems we faith, face by helping us to know the promises that you give and also the principles of devotion and desire that are needed in order to ascertain your will. We thank you, God, that everything in your word was written before, that through knowledge and learning and instruction, we might have hope, we might have faith, we might have assurance. Father, we pray that your word would be planted on fertile soil, that it might bless those who have listened. In Jesus' wonderful and mighty name we pray. Amen, and we'll see you next time.